so welcome to Physics 524. Um, today I'm going to talk about uh, a number of things, a um, number of topics, uh, two or three topics that are closely related. Um, the, the main topic is um, uh, Landau's theory of um, phase transitions. And um, so basically, uh, oh Lord, I forgot to print out the, um, I forgot to print out my notes, but I think I can probably manage with these notes. So the, the basic idea, first of all, is um, that of an order parameter. And um, as this is a physical parameter of a system, so I'm thinking in terms of condensed matter as a, a, a or, or of quantum field theory, either one. And um, by the way, I have a cold, so you should stay away from me. Um, that guy sitting way in the back is really safe now, but if I walk right on the back blackboard, you should move forward. Um, so this is. Uh, a physical parameter of the theory, um, such as, for example, the magnetization in the case of a ferromagnet, um, uh, or the amount of gas versus liquid in the case of um, a fluid, uh, that, that's an order parameter. And if you have a transition uh, in the order parameter, You can have um, two kinds of transitions. You can have a discontinuous or a continuous transition in the order parameter. If it's discontinuous, this is first order. And if it's continuous, then it's second order. And so these are the, that's the terminology, first and second order phase transitions. Um, discontinuous is first order, continuous is uh, second order. And um, Landau analyzed these. Oh, let me just mention some examples. Um, are um, uh, binary alloys, uh, fluids, helium four, many many different um, systems in condensed matter, and. Um, What's, what's curious here, let me give a, a, draw a picture here of, um, for example, the archetypical case, of course, is the ferromagnet, and in particular the Heisenberg ferromagnet. Um, so here's an external magnetic field, and um, the order parameter then is the average magnetization, or mean, magnetization and what, what is noticed which you probably already know but I'll be saying it anyway is that at very low temperatures small changes in the in an external magnetic field can cause the magnetization to shift from one direction to the other. And here, uh, I'm thinking about a, uh, an ideal ferromagnet in which uh, spins can point up or down. Uh, and so the, the average spin direction can be positive or negative, but as you switch from small positive or negative external fields, the magnetization 
the mean magnetization shifts from positive to negative, from negative to positive, depending on the correlation there. So this here is a first order transition. And as you raise the temperature, though, this axis here is temperature, you get to a certain point called the critical point in which the discontinue, in which the system no longer responds dramatically to small changes in the external field. And uh, over here, then, it becomes second order. And the point at which that happens is called the critical point. Temperature's a little bit higher than the critical point. You can raise or lower H a little bit, and the system won't change very much. It'll change continuously. Whereas over here, at temperatures below the critical point, it changes in a discontinuous way. And, um, and this line, uh, this axis, here what we have is magnetization greater than zero, and here typically we have m equals zero, at least for h in the vicinity of zero. And um, what um, Landau did was to introduce a Gibbs free energy, um, free energy, And um, this satisfies the equation that um, the partial of the Gibbs with respect to the magnetization is the magnetic field itself. The ex this is the external magnetic field. And um, what he did was, in as much as we're talking about phase transitions for small h, and in fact, um, one is talking about relatively small m, um, he expanded, this is Landau, I should say, L-A-N-D-A-U. He was a um, prominent Russian or Soviet uh, physicist who um, did brilliant things until he was in a car accident. Um, so wear your seatbelts. Um, anyhow, he expanded this then as A of T plus B of T M squared plus C of T M to the fourth. And um, now, why did he choose even terms? So only even terms uh, because uh, G of minus M is the same as G of M. In other words, the magnetization in one direction has the same free energy as the system when the magnetization is in the other direction. And um, so then, um, if you're looking at small h, which is what we're talking about when we're examining phase transitions, small h, uh, what we're talking about then is that h is essentially zero. And when h is zero, that means that the partial of g with respect to m at constant temperature is, um, well, we just take the derivative of this equation, and what we get is 2b m plus 4c m cubed. Now, um, for one class of systems, namely if c and b are both positive, uh, this implies uh, m equal to zero, but on the other hand, if one of them is negative, then one can have a non-trivial solution. And 
if this is the free energy, you expect that free energy, you like free, you like energies free or not, to be basically positive when uh, parameters like the magnetization get large, and so we're always going to have C greater than zero, or almost always, and so what the interesting case then is B negative. And when B is negative, one can solve this thing, and one gets 2C M, uh, M dividing out by one factor of M, 2C M squared is equal to minus B, or M is equal to uh, the square root of B, of minus B over 2C, or plus or minus that. Notice the plus or minus is important. So there are two possible values of the magnetization. By the way, as usual, I give out candy for questions. So. B of T near the critical point as saying that it's B times T minus TC. So for, for uh, temperatures higher than the critical point, you're not going to have any solution M being plus or minus uh, uh, some value. Instead, you're going to have uh, essentially m equal to zero at higher temperatures. And um, on the other hand, if you do say that B is this, and you take C of T just to be some constant C, then this turns into plus or minus the square root of B T C minus T over uh, 2c. And uh, so that's, a, that's an interesting dependence of the um, order parameter, here the, the mean magnetization, uh, upon the temperature. And you see it's a square root dependence. In other words, it's plus or minus the square root of b over 2c times uh, tc minus t to the 1 half. That's um, whereas, of course, uh, m equals zero for um, t greater than t c. So this is um, this is a nice uh, a nice result. That one half is called the critical exponent. And um, notice that there was very little said about the system here. The one thing that was said was symmetry, namely g of m, g of minus m equals g of m. And then that we were looking at things for small values of h, and um, we were going to use the Gibbs free energy, and um, we we're going to be expanding for small values of m and so forth. So in other words, one expects behavior like this for a large class of systems. And um, that's an interesting aspect of, uh, of condensed matter physics that arose from uh, Landau's uh, work. A more general expression for the Gibbs free energy is to write it as a function of m and h. And then this is as a of t plus b of t times the square of the mean magnetization plus c of t uh, times the fourth power of the mean magnetization and then minus hm. And so this once again gives, um, if you look for the minimum of g with respect to m, 
at fixed h, then what this gives you is again 2b m uh, plus 4c m cubed minus h, and then this is um, similar to this equation, but it's just a generalization of this equation. This, uh, this was h equals 0. This gives you the value of h um, uh, in general, namely h equal to 2bm plus 4c uh, m cubed. Uh, the picture here of G is um, here I'm plotting M and there are two curves. One curve is for T greater than TC and then another curve is for uh, t less than tc. This, of course, should remind you of the Higgs mechanism, which is when um, the, uh, the Higgs potential is uh, something like um, h minus, I don't know, u squared or lambda squared, h squared. So the Higgs potential looks like that, and so the mean value of H is uh, mu over square root of lambda. Um, so that's that's um, close correlation between the Higgs mechanism and condensed matter physics. Um, Another thing that uh, what, what Landau did was to write the mean magnetization as sim or the magnetization as simply a, uh, an integral of the spins. And uh, here we're still talking about, I guess, spins going in one direction or another. So it's just a real number. So the spin, one can think of it as a, instead of a lattice of spins, one can think of it as a continuous field of spins. And um, then this gives free energy a natural way of generalizing it is to say it's an integral dq dex of a half rad s Squared, at least if we're in three dimensions, plus little b t minus t critical times s squared plus some c times s to the fourth, and then minus h times s, and all this is being integrated, s being s of x. Um, Here, uh, the function b of t has been, uh, yeah, the, where we're using this approximation that I guess I wrote down just immediately, just saying that b is minus b times tc minus t. Um, Right. Okay, so, or to write it the other way with a plus sign, b times t minus tc. c is just some positive number. So this is the field theory version of the, um, of uh, the Landau theory. Um, The, the way you get to a differential equation for this is you say that the, uh, that the, you take the variational derivative of G with respect to S and um, 
I have plenty of time in this lecture, so I'm going to pause now and say some things about variational, about functional derivatives that um, I did remember to print out, whereas I forgot to print out my notes on, um, on the main subject of this talk. Uh, so I'm going to say something about functional derivatives. This is chapter 19 of um, my book, and it's something we skipped in 523, skipped in 460, whatever. Um, so let's, let me say, let me just make a few definitions here. The idea, of course, first of all, of, of a functional. Um, so let me say here what a functional is. A functional, well, you know, a function maps a number to a number. A functional maps a function to a number. So it's a map from functions to numbers. And um, one can have a double functional. And in fact, the variational derivative can be thought of as the ordinary derivative of a functional where you change f by epsilon h. And we're doing this at epsilon equals to zero. So this is one way of thinking of um, what a variational derivative is. In fact, this is a this is a nice way of thinking about it that avoids the sort of ambiguities that one could easily get into otherwise. Um, so let's take as an example g sub n of f. This is a functional dx f to the n of x. So now, here, let me get rid of some of this material here. So what's the just the definition of the variational derivative here? G sub n Notice it has an extra parameter in it, h. And so this is d by d epsilon of g sub n of f plus epsilon h, again at epsilon equal to zero. And so what is this? So once we just implement this, it's rather, it becomes much clearer and simpler. This is simply f of x plus epsilon, whatever that function h is, h of x, this thing raised to the nth power. And now we're to take the derivative in the limit in which epsilon is zero. And um, so if this is, if we're looking at this in the limit of epsilon, small epsilon, then this would be d by d epsilon of an integral dx f to the n plus n epsilon f to the n minus 1 h. In other words, we expand that power and we keep only one term, epsilon. Now we differentiate. And what we get is um, n integral dx of um, f to the n minus 1 of x, h of x. So that's uh, the variational derivative defined in a somewhat mathematical way. Now, physicists often use a, or almost always use a simpler notation 
the notation in physics classes is the variational derivative is we write it that way and this is in the language I just defined it's delta sub y in other words it is an integral dx of uh, n f to the n minus 1 delta x minus y, which then is n f to the n minus 1 at y. In other words, we replace the function, the function h by delta of x minus y, and so this is n integral dx f to the n minus 1 of x, and now h of x is just delta of x minus y. And that then gives us um, this expression. So that's, that's, that's the way it is, that's the notation used in physics departments. And um, however, that notation, if, if, if you just look at the left-hand side here and imagine um, uh, imagine that you are putting in a delta function, it can, it can easily become um, quite confusing. And so it's better to start with this and then make the transition replacing h by delta of x minus y, and then one um, understands what one is doing. Otherwise, you get things like squares of delta functions not well defined. Um, let's look at a case where the functional itself is an integral of the square of a derivative, say. Then um, the variational derivative will be d by d epsilon as usual g of f plus epsilon h again at epsilon equal to zero and so this is d by d epsilon of an integral dx of f prime of x plus epsilon h prime of x notice I'm treating Epsilon is a constant, not a function. And so if we expand that thing, keeping only lowest powers of epsilon, do the differentiation, what we get is integral dx 2 f prime of x h prime of x. And, uh, and now, Um, what we're thinking about in general is that uh, in physics notation we're thinking of H as um, a function that's limited in, um, in that the, the range of, of values of X for which H is non-zero is limited so we can integrate by parts and drop the surface term so we get minus 2 dx, h of x, f double prime of x. Now if we make the transition to physics notation, we replace h of x by a delta function, what we get is minus 2 delta of x minus y, f double prime of x, and this is just minus 2 f double prime of y. Of course, one could have made the transition to a delta function here, because derivatives of delta functions are well defined. And in fact, the secret of derivatives of delta functions is the derivative of a delta function is defined to be 
what you'd get if you could integrate by parts with no problem and drop the surface terms. So this is by definition minus 2 integral dx f double prime of x delta of x minus y. And that once again gives you this value. So So let's see, I think well maybe I should go a little bit further, just um, say a couple more things about suppose we're talking about the action. of a non-relativistic particle and the potential, this is then d by d epsilon, s of q plus epsilon h, this is then d by d epsilon of an integral dt now, and it would be m over 2 q dot plus epsilon h dot squared minus v of q plus epsilon h. And now if we carry this out, what we get is um, an integral dt m q dot h dot minus v prime of q h of t and Integrating by parts, we get um, minus m d double dot uh, minus d prime h, and uh, that gives us, of course, the differential equation. M q double dot is equal to um, minus B prime, which is of course the classic equation of motion. Um, Maybe one more example might be useful. Um, it's not directly related to the phase transitions, but it gives you another example of a functional use of fun functionals and use of functional derivatives. Suppose we have an integral, the length of something, which is dx squared plus dy squared. Uh, Equivalently, an integral of square root of 1 plus y prime squared dx. So that's the length of a curve uh, going from, let us say, x0 to x1. And um, what's the shortest path? Well, that's the one that minimizes this. And so we compute a variational derivative here. As again, d by d epsilon L y plus epsilon h. Um, by the way, I think what I'll do is use the same web pages for 523. So I'll just be adding stuff to that web page rather than having two web pages. Um, so this is d by d epsilon of an integral square root of 1 plus y prime plus epsilon h prime squared dx, expanding and so forth, uh, what we get is when we do this uh, differentiation, we get uh, y prime h prime over square root of 1 plus y prime squared 
dx. And now we integrate by parts and we get minus integral h d by dx y prime over square root 1 plus y prime squared dx. And we're setting that to 0 because we're trying to minimize this thing. Now we go to physics lingo and replace h by delta of x minus y. And um, that gives us uh, the equation e by dx of y prime over, well, it's just what that is, d by d prime, uh, d by dx of y prime over square root of 1 plus y prime squared uh, equal to 0. And uh, this implies in particular y double prime to be 0. And now this is, of course, gives you a um, rather disappointingly trivial result, namely that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. Well, that's, you didn't need functional derivatives to figure that out, but um, it's comforting that we didn't get something more complicated. All right, I think, well, all right, one more thing, higher order functional derivatives. Um, and so let me say what, what they are. D2 of G of F and H, this is then defined as D2 the epsilon squared of G of F plus epsilon H, again at epsilon equal to zero. So as an example, G sub n to be an integral f to the n dx and um, the second variational derivative here is then d2 d epsilon squared of let me skip one step it would be an integral of f plus epsilon h to the n dx. And now we're taking a second derivative. So um, we need to keep the second order term in epsilon, but um, we can forget about the zeroth and first order term, and we can forget about cubic and higher terms. And so what this gives us is n, n minus 1 integral f to the n minus 2 of x, h squared of x dx. And um, so um, I think maybe one more example might be useful because um, all right, let me carry this out one more time. Uh, suppose we're doing this for, again, our simplest example of um, just an ordinary uh, particle in a one-dimensional potential. We have then, in fact, I'm making this to be a free particle. So this is um, u dot plus uh, epsilon h dot squared. And um, this turns out to be an integral dt of h dot squared. And what this is telling us is that the that the second functional derivative is non-negative. And um, that's um, kind of interesting because it means that if you solve the first order equation and find the solution, then 
any small change in the solution uh, raises the action. So in other words, the solution is stable. So this is a stable solution. One of the reasons why I didn't insert delta of x minus y here is that for second order, second functional derivatives, the recipe of sticking in a delta function isn't so sensible. And so one is better to stay with a mathematical definition. But this is how one analyzes the stability of various systems. Okay. And if, one, if we did put in a potential, let me just say what the answer would be. It would be an integral dt of m h dot squared minus v double prime h squared. And so this can be positive or negative or zero. And um, so that means that the solution can be stable or unstable and chaos can arise, arise in systems of several particles when the second variation about a stationary path is negative. So in other words, small changes can, can take the point of distance. All right, I think that's enough about, um, I'll put this chapter on the class webpage. But I think that's enough about functional derivatives for the moment. And I, I hope that makes you feel better about functional derivatives. Um, I know when I was a student, I was always um, bothered um, by some of the ambiguities that occur, the, the square of the delta function problem. So let's, let's go to the case of um, this particular, in fact, let's go back here, I guess, to this uh, G and see what happens when we take the variational derivative here. So, uh, what we would be saying is that this is d by d epsilon of an integral dq dx one half grad s plus epsilon h squared plus b t minus t c s plus epsilon h squared. And um, now we're just taking the first derivative. And so this would be integral dx. We would have here um, the grad goes through. And so we would have grad s dot grad uh, h. Uh, and the two would cancel, and then over here, we would have B T minus T C uh, S H. And once again, we think of H as a, a function of limited support. So we can integrate by parts, or equivalently, at this point, we replace it by a delta function. And um, so what we get is the equation minus um, uh, grad squared s uh, plus b t minus t c s. And we're setting all of that equal to 0. And, uh, or not equal to 0, rather equal. I shouldn't have said it. Yeah, we said, oh, I left out h. I left out h in this term. So that's uh, minus h 
S plus epsilon H. And so this, um, we're setting it equal to zero, but we have minus H uh, there, equal to zero. And so the equation that we get is um, minus grad squared plus 2B T minus TC S of X is equal to H of X. Here we're thinking of having the magnetic, the external magnetic field is a field as opposed to a constant value. And so this is actually H of X just as this is S of X. And um, what I've been following here is uh, chapter 8 of, of Peskin and Schroeder. Um, I've warmed up a little bit to uh, that. That textbook is better than better than I thought. So I've um, I, I think I think I'm going to draw some material out of it. Four, five, twenty-four, and um, once one has an equation of this form, uh, one. A common practice in physics is to replace the external field by simply a delta function and then to, to see, uh, uh, to solve the resulting equation. And so what one has is something like this, minus rad squared plus 2b t minus tc. I don't know why they switched, we switched here from, well, we're going to call it D of X equals H0 delta cubed of X. So we have a magnetic field that's localized at the origin. What's the uh, effect of that? Well, the way you solve this kind of equation, of course, is you write D of X as an integral d cubed k e to the i k dot x and um, times some, let us say, f of k. And now this left-hand side thing gives us integral minus grad squared pulls down a k squared. So this is k squared plus 2b t minus tc. Uh, e to the i kx f of k has to equal h0 delta cubed of x. So that means that f of k has to be 1 over this structure. So f of k is 1 over k squared plus 2b t minus tc. Um, times h0 because of course uh, n is a factor of 1 over 2 pi cubed. So if we let uh, f of k be that, then this is integral d cubed k over 2 pi cubed e to the i k dot x, uh, h0 over k squared plus 2b t minus tc. And um, right. And if we do this integral, this is an integral that you guys, I hope, have seen. It's analyzed in my book in several places because it's such an important integral. It's basically the Yukawa integral. And uh, what we get is then the d of x is equal to h0 over 4 pi e to the minus r over c divided by r 
where C is equal to 2B times T minus TC to the minus one half. Now, there are a couple of interesting things about this. First, you see that when T is um, near to TC, in fact, when T is equal to TC, then this is uh, the Yukawa potential for a massless particle, which means you have long range forces. This C is the correlation length. And you see that the correlation length diverges um, as T approaches TC from above. When T is below TC, you've um, when T is below TC, you've got uh, uh, well. Let me think about that. This all of this seems to work when T is less than T. Well, you've got a pole here, so. Um, I should think about that a little more, what happens there. This D of X, by the way, that we're talking about, this is, in effect, it's the mean value of S of X dotted into uh, times, it's just a scalar, so it's times S of zero. It's the mean value of this correlation. So it's it's the mean value of this product, which is a correlation function. And um, having solved for it, we found it to be this. And for t greater than tc, we get uh, this answer. For t less than tc, c is imaginary. And um, uh, because of this pole, one has to think about this again. Right? When I was preparing this lecture, I hadn't thought about that particular case. Um, Let me give you just a sign. T less than TC is where we have the first order discontinuity. Question? I just, if, if that's complex, then you just get a sinusoid. You get a sinusoid, when you? E to the minus something that's complex. I don't know, it may not work. Yeah, you might have to deal with the integral. Yeah, it doesn't change it. Yeah, it doesn't change it. the solution here for t greater than tc and um, it um, goes crazy at t equal to tc and below. Um, so let me just say a few more things um, about this. Wait, so are you saying that the, the approach to the, the Yukawa potential for the long range forces happens when T equals TC or when T is greater than TC? Well, you see, when T is greater than TC, then C is finite. Right. And so this uh, C plays the right role, the, the, for, the, for, the forces cut off exponentially. And it has a range equal to C, roughly. For R less than C, it's substantial. But for R greater than C, it's decreasing uh, exponentially. So for and as T approaches TC from positive, from greater values, 
this correlation length becomes longer and longer. And um, that's something that I forgot to mention. Um, as I said, I wrote up notes and latex them and then forgot to print them. Um, it's basically that as T approaches TC from above, the fluctuations get longer and longer in range. And um, All right, let me just give you a little more uh, about this. Um, so all this analysis was based on just Landau's very simple assumptions that use the Gibbs free energy, write it in the simplest possible way, keep on the even terms in M because of the symmetry, M goes to minus M. Um, and so that means that these things uh, apply in a uh, much wider context. Um, let's see, the value of M that we found over there was M, for this symbol theory, we got M equal to plus or minus the square root of B over 2C times TC minus T uh, to the one half, and this was the magnetism. This is for t less than t c, and um, what what happens in more general systems is that this exponent here, which is called beta, one has m. proportional to a power of Tc minus T, again for T less than the critical temperature, and um, beta is called a critical exponent. And the critical exponent, um, it's one half for the class of theories that are well approximated in this simple Landau fashion is a more general Landau fashion that applies to other classes of, of systems. And for those systems, beta is constant for each class. And um, for example, um, beta is 0 0.313 for um, a three-dimensional so this is a 3D magnet. Um, with a single axis. So it's a magnet in three dimensions, but um, I guess the spins can only point up or down. And also for certain classes of fluids, the critical exponent has a has a particular value. Uh, 3.313. So uh, this, these are remarkable results and caused a great deal of enthusiasm in condensed matter physics as they were discovered over the past um, I, I don't know when it started but it was I would guess that it started around the 1950s. These um, things were uh, disco uh, discovered. Anderson was analyzing systems like this um, back in either the late 50s or the early 60s. Um, now, of course, the weight if, if the way to analyze um, a quantum system of uh, that's a either a field theory or a system of many uh, a system defined on a lattice, uh, which is 
what you naturally do for crystals, um, or a continue a, a system like a fluid, um, which although composed of well is composed of many many molecules. Um, one way of analyzing these things is to uh, define the beta fun the uh, partition function, as we were talking about. Uh, this is the trace of e to the minus beta h, and um, this trace can be written as a, a, a a functional integral, and uh, so it's e to the minus a uh, the Euclidean action, and then you integrate over all the fields. So that's um, the formulation um, that um, we went through in the final weeks of 523. And um, the idea there was that in a um, that a Euclidean time ordered product of fields. Let me just do two for simplicity. This is a uh, ratio of integrals then of 5x1, 5x2, e to the minus the Euclidean action dP, and then normalized by dP, or normalized by beta, by z of beta, or by the partition function effectively. And um, the, the, uh, value at a given temp here I left out a, uh, a beta beta here is 1 over kt and um, so the, the these are the field theory equations that would give us um, that are the right way to treat um, these questions in the context of field theory. Um, all right, I, as you know, I've ha I have a cold, and I think I'll stop three minutes early today. Um, so I'll, I'll continue with this, but um, I'm thinking of um, mixing in things from many different books, uh, Weinberg, Heskin Schroeder, and uh, Anthony Z's book, uh, Quantum Field Theory in a Nutshell, um, which is uh, a book that uh, students like a lot. Um, I think this, I think one can get all of them from b-ok.org. The version I have, though, of Peskin and Schroeder from that uh, website is missing all the figures. Um, but I think the Z book is available and um, the Weinberg book. All right, so why don't we, uh, any questions? There haven't been many questions today. I can't have been too clear. I never am too. Clear. I never make that mistake. Okay, much <laughs> turn.